quite an interesting one for me and it's lovely to be on this panel. I'm hoping that you're all going to get together a whole lot of uh, good questions in your head to ask at the end. Um, but why um, design for change? Uh, I think design is one of those very loaded words that's overused. So design is generally sort of a deliberate intent of some kind of problem solving. And if we talk about people as designers, and I, I would use a broad interpretation of designers, so anyone from a creative background, why do these designers make really good agents for change? Now don't view us all as lycra-clad superheroes that are going to make massive change fast and come in and save the day, because I think designers are very much part of a lot of the problems that we have right now on the planet, um, overconsumption, um, uh, poor manufacturing, um, you know, uh, materials invested in technologies that we don't need. But one thing that we do, um, particularly in the university context, is design uh, curriculum and develop um, individuals as graduates that are really good creative thinkers um, and can look at what we call uh, wicked problems. And wicked problems are, are fairly intractable problems with lots and lots of um, convoluted and difficult uh, complex aspects to them and the idea of when uh, you're trying to solve a wicked problem is any solution that you come up with is going to create other problems so sustainability is a really good example of a wicked problem every attempt you have at being more sustainable um, you know, it involves more materials or involves more energy being used or involves other impacts and the idea of um, solving a wicked problem is to find the least sticky of the solution. So the solution that has the lowest impact. And because we train designers in a methodology uh, called design thinking, which is a, a, a whole systems approach that includes not only, um, the idea of uh, this one, he's a design thinker, can you pick him? So he thinks a little bit differently to mainstream thinking. So we, <coughs> we are very good at, as creative thinkers and designers of uh, thinking around mainstream siloed solution delivery. And we do that by taking a whole systems approach. So rather than just saying, we have a problem here, it's like I say, I've got a sore back. Well, any chiro will tell you that your sore back is generally related to another part of the body. It's not your back that's sore, it's your foot that's not standing straight or your hips sticking out too far or your, your seat's wrong. So rather than treating the symptom, we're trying to look at the cause. And so this whole systems approach of looking at everything and, and how it impacts any change, impacts on anything else, opens up a whole pile, a whole can of worms of problems for you to look at as a designer. And this is where I'm going with the idea of the, the wicked problem. So um, you've got lots of these little worms popping out of the can. Which one should you approach to solve? Which one shouldn't you solve? Which one should you leave alone? Um, and so designers, we hope when we send them out of the institution, are able to explore any problem from multiple perspectives, which means that they need to have a very clear understanding of all the people and the systems involved in the solutions that they're providing. So designers need to become mediators between all the different views and needs. And I, I think um, one of the, the really interesting problems that design's created uh, recently and is, we've been quite vocal around in Australia is container deposit legislation and there's a huge amount in the media at the moment and you know, designers design packaging uh, for drinks, um, designers design the advertising to sell those drinks, um, designers design displays to display those drinks um, and then we provide opportunities for people to drink them and then we don't design a system to dispose properly or recycle the materials that have been invested in the drink bottles and containers that, that have, have come out of it. So I think this is a really good example of a wicked problem. And I heard a great debate on the radio on the way in today. And the debate was, um, you know, is it really bad to have beverage containers? What's, what's wrong with it? it? It kicks our economy along, we, you know, it creates jobs. Um, and shouldn't we just make more bins for it to be recycled in? Wouldn't that be more uh, appropriate solution than to not have beverage containers. And it was a very persuasive argument on both sides of whether we should allow uh, um, uh, to continue having beverage containers and no deposit legislation to uh, encourage people to collect them um, or provide more bins or to put a container deposit legislation in place. What is the right answer? Well, everyone will tell you one side or the other. I'm not going to land either way this evening. 
Um, as a designer, I would be listening to the two arguments and looking for opportunities. So, for example, if I leant towards should we have to contain a deposit legislation, I'd be saying, great, how can we encourage people through providing good information or designing good information and good systems to um, collect these containers and we can then recycle them. If um, legislation fell on the side of no container deposit legislation, how do we develop systems that encourage people without a financial benefit to recycle? Um, and it would be a different type of communication. But because designers are great at communicating and framing solutions and navigating needs into a, in the final outcome, um, we're ideally placed to solve these kinds of wicked problems, but unfortunately we're not often invited to come to the table for that discussion. Um, and there are multiple reasons for that, but it's often because we avoid, as a, an industry of creative people, putting ourselves out there uh, and, and getting involved in technical, um, economic or financial or business kinds of discussions. And I think it's sad because design thinking can create some really wonderful solutions to issues in these realms. Basically because we can navigate creatively solutions to a lot of problems, we do take the whole system's approach, um, but also because we're very good at identifying opportunities because we're looking at an entire system. And I, I love the, the blue goldfish. I think gold goldfish should actually be blue, not orange. It's far more exciting. But um, we are <coughs> there always seems a bit of a surprise when you see a creative person hailed for having a great solution to a big entrenched problem. Uh, it doesn't surprise me. I think this is where a lot of our um, activists come from and they're, and they're great communicators because they have a creative way of looking at things. The other thing that designers and the people we, we reproduce here at COFA and at the university um, are, are good at prototyping and testing and modelling various solutions to see which ones work the best. And this is a, a photo from a talk we had a couple of months ago here at COFA from some, um, some designers from uh, Belgium who have been travelling the world looking at design solutions in th to third world problems and realising that a colonialist approach to come in and say, hey, you're a third world country, we've got a first world solution for you, here it is, see you later, is not the best way to provide these solutions. And in fact, uh, uh, one of the design thinking methods, which is um, co-design and co-creation, is to work with the community for them to develop their own solution to their problems. And this uh, was refreshed in my mind last night when I had a wonderful presentation from a woman from East Timor from a little village called Soibada, which is a, a, a sister village for Pitwater. And Soibada is essentially a large convent um, school and a number of little dwellings and a subsistence farming community. And when we take volunteers up there to help the community develop, the first response for most blokes is to whip out a hammer and want to fix something. But the community doesn't want any fi fix. They like their infrastructure. What they're really interested in is getting technology in place so that they can learn English better and get skills. So in fact, the most useful person that we've sent up to Soibara is a hairdresser who's taught the, the local community how to cut hair. So they've never all got an, a way other than agriculture to make income. So that Soibara, if you're in the Highlands of East Timor, is now the place to go to get your hair cut. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds a bit funny, but there, there was no one who could cut hair. And, and it's, a, it's an essential service. So um, sometimes it, you know, it takes a different approach to looking at things. So no, they don't, the fact that they only have one toilet between 215 houses, so it's about 1,000 people, is not the problem. But, but in fact, it's skilling these people up, providing them the internet, getting them mobile phones so they can communicate across borders and barriers is a really important thing. And so uh, prototyping and testing with this community to understand more deeply what their concerns are and to provide relevant solutions to their problems is much better than coming in and saying, Hi, I'm an engineer, you need a new toilet, because they don't feel they need the new toilet. Um, and in fact, they get more value from the other options. So it's a design thinking that can provide more insights into what the community wants because it's a, a user-based experience. The other thing that designers are, are really good at is, um, after prototyping, is communicating the vision. So this is a, unfortunately, a bad resolution slide, but it's a picture of a tap. Um, uh, there's a, a woman here in Spain, and she's got tap water that she can drink and has access to readily any day of the week. Um, and it shows the fact that the city has invested in putting this tap in, 
Um, and the money that's paid for that tap provides a second tap on the other side of the world to a community that doesn't have access to fresh and clean water. Uh, and so this was a, a, a team of designers who thought, um, how do we best communicate to people that you can partner with a third world community that needs fresh water? Um, and really simple graphic shows all the, the things joining up underneath. I actually love to have a picture of a Kofa tap out here somewhere um, and somewhere in the world where we've, um, maybe we can talk to the Dean when he's here later. It costs $2,000 to put one of these taps in and then another community somewhere in the world gets fresh water um, that hasn't had that before. This solves a whole lot of problems, uh, particularly educational problems because the kids get sick and can't go to school, can't learn, can't get into a better financial situation. But if they don't get sick and they can go to school, because they've had fresh water rather than contaminated water, they're in a much better position to move ahead. So I suppose in, in uh, just generally talking about designers, these are the kinds of skills that we have to be great change makers. And uh, one of the things that I have a luxury of being a, an academic here is I get to build capacity of young designers and I love watching them develop these skills. And they often say to me, you know, is it too idealistic to do this project? And we might sort of mould a, a project uh, a bit. Um, and then they say, we don't have the skills to get this project off the ground that, that's going to make good positive change happen. And then I say to them, well, what are your spheres of influence? What are your networks? Who can we pair you up with that you know or that someone else you know knows to get your projects running? And if just been appointed a um, convener, uh, the university's convener for a group called Enactus, which is a global organisation for social entrepreneurs, and it gets young students at university to work in cross-disciplinary teams, so across different areas of engineering, design, business, to put together models for, um, uh, you know, strong economic based models for small business that allows them to have impact on problems in communities across Australia and the globe. There's 85 countries involved and it's funded heavily by a number of large consultancies worldwide as a, a CSR project. It's been running for about 25 years and we've got some projects that are running for six or seven years at the university. And the, this year they've just, we've decided um, with these wonderful young students from all the different faculties to adopt a town that's dying in rural New South Wales and look at all the different skill sets that the students have and see how they can save that town from dying, which is going to be quite a bit of fun. And uh, that we're bracing that around um, sustainability. And I said to the students, we've got you know, four different pillars to sustainability that we need to look at with our design thinking hats on. And that's um, you know, how are we going to go into this small village or town or whatever, whoever we select, um, and, and preserve what they like about their community, so have a, a good social approach. Um, to understand what their local ecology needs and so that we don't impact in a negative way on that. Um, what, what are their economic systems and, and how can we strengthen them through our um, uh, activities? And how can we develop the capacity for leadership um, within that community so that when we leave, we're not just leaving them with something that they cannot manage themselves. So this is taking a sustainable approach, um, using design thinking to create a solution uh, that makes us redundant and that's ideal in, in, in um, this kind of situation because it means that um, you can then move on and solve the next problem and leave these guys with a solution that, that, that suits them. Um, so that, that's sort of what, what I do with the students here but there's a few other things I do at COFA um, that's, that's building capacity for students for um, social change and sustainability change. One of them is a, a newly developed course in permaculture um, it's been really heavily subscribed by students from across all the faculties at the university because it's quite a, and I'm sure um, Costa and Diane will expand on it, it's a, it's a social movement globally, it's a design system thinking, a design uh, thinking system and it's been developed here in Australia um, and in fact the two key theorists are still alive and, um, and kicking and doing it and a wonderful thing for our students is that they can interact with these people. Um, I've, central a lot of my research around social innovation and I've formed with a colleague of mine from the Faculty of Engineering a group called Social Innovation Sydney and what we do with this is um, link people who want to make change happen 
with other people who have the capacity to make that change happen. And so we, we um, have monthly events to create stimulus around particular issues and then uh, ask people who are interested in solving some of these issues uh, to pair with other people who have the capacity to do that. So it's a capacity building um, exercise again. And I think, um, again, if you think of the spheres of influence you have, how can you use them to create positive change and design a new system? Um, I've also recently been, been elected to Pitwater Council, and this is part of, I suppose, the leadership question um, in design thinking. And we've been using design uh, methods with our local community groups to change how we deal and communicate with our local community. And the wonderful thing about this is we've taken 18 different local community groups who have been warring constantly for about the past 25 years over um, uh, limited resources and through design thinking led them to, uh, to a conclusion that they all have the same goals. They're just voicing them differently. And by working together, um, rather than warring with each other, we're going to be able to apply those limited resources to a better outcome for everyone. And so we've had eight policy changes as a result of the design thinking methods that we've used to communicate, um, including developing uh, verge planning and community garden policy, um, uh, developing um, a new policy around um, uh, educating people with uh, sustainability and waste usage uh, uh, and disposal. And we're currently developing a community arts plan. And guess what? We're encouraging the artists to be involved with the community on sustainability projects because we can view that there's a great synthesis between those two. Um, the very last uh, aspect of a look at myself is um, I, the spheres that I have that I can help other people um, educate themselves and behave um, and design a better future. It's me just as a citizen and I'm currently undergoing a renovation. I promised no renovation photos to Diane, so there are none. But if you're interested, you can go to greenstop.com and have a look. Um, but we have been trying to do a sustainable build and um, it's pretty much impossible. I don't think any building project is going to be sustainable, but you can do some better than others. And one of the things that horrified me was my builder was very happy to tell me that he shipped all of the fill from our site, that's 27 tonnes of it, to Queensland because it's very sustainable to do that. And I uh, said, so we've got a waste facility three kilometres from here. Why have you shipped all my fuel to Queensland? Oh, because it's cheaper and Brisbane River's eroding and they want to fill Brisbane River in. The cheaper thing rang in my mind, and I think what, what um, a lot of us have to realise is that, yes, things can be cheap, but they come at a cost, an environmental cost. And uh, you know, I've been trying to prove that a green build is, is going to long-term save you money and, and, and can be done affordably. Um, and sadly, I'm finding that uh, my hypothesis is inaccurate. <laughs> um, but I'm hoping that as more change makers pursue similar um, goals, that a critical mass in a market will, in effect, um, appear and it will become affordable. Um, and more accessible for people to build sustainably in Australia. We have far fewer options. We have, uh, um, it's much more difficult to get the resources that we need than any other country. And in fact, we're really behind the eight ball. And one of the things I think designers need to do is specify uh, better for sustainable design that they need. To, I mean, we've got some great people in the audience here. We've got Beatrice from the Hemp Association. I would have loved to use hemp concrete in my build impossible, it could not be signed off by my certifier in my local council area. I can't use my recycled glass for the same reason. I have had to fight tooth and nail to use recycled wood in our balconies because they didn't want to certify it. Um, so it's very difficult and policy needs to be changed. So I think, you know, again, as a policy maker, I'm now in a position to look at changing this policy. But as consumers, you can also push to have these policies changed by writing to the appropriate people and asking your politicians to design a better society. Um, Joanna's looking at her watch and that's my last slide. So some questions to ask yourself. The one question I'd like to, you to take away this evening is what are your spheres of influence and how can you, you use them to design a better future? Thanks. When I started off my journey, when I sort of jumped ship from careers, and one of the things that I did that is I actually went back to do a Master's of Design. So for those of you who are master's students, I understand that. And one of the turning points for me, um, sorry, 
was um, actually I did a review of the container deposit legislation system some 10 years ago. <laughs> And um, there hasn't been very much movement, but it was a very interesting process to go through. Um, and then also, uh, coincidentally, some friends and I did a rural tour um, like a, a couple of months ago and decided to came across a little town that was in need of regeneration and came up with a very similar project um, to what you were just sort of talking about. So um, that's already good. But um, hi, I'm Diane. I'm currently program manager of a place called the Green Living Centre and what I'm sort of going to do, talk to you about today is a little bit about my journey as a designer. Um, I've worked in academic spheres and um, now I'm working in local government um, in a closer to community and I'll sort of explain that those projects in a little bit more detail but I kind of um, think that sustainability is um, like what, what are we trying to sustain? I often ask myself the question of why now? What are we trying to sustain now? But I also get incredibly sick of the constant debate and pessimism around the debate of climate change. And at some point in time, and you know, there's lots of kind of conversation around, you know, do we really need to bring this into a presentation or, you know, should we be focusing on positive solutions? And part of me gets really angry and just sort of says, well, like maybe we do need to remind ourselves and, and it's not meant to be disempowering, but it's just meant to be that we're not talking about the future anymore, that climate change is already here and we need to get serious about it and mitigate what we can now. Um, Adapt, build adaptive solutions where possible and the main thing is we need to build more resilient communities and I think that that's design has a very integral role in in all of those three aspects mitigating adapting and building more resilient communities and I hope my presentation will sort of show that so just so um, I'm not sure how many people did see this but um, we did have 123 records broken over the summer this is from the climate commission's um, report angry summer um, so it's a, it's a very interesting report, um, but this this probably what we're getting do, better at doing right now is synthesising some of this data and then trying to communicate it. So of those um, 123 records, what was really apparent is that there's vulnerability to systems and there's unknown economic costs. So the economic costs of change is no longer a valid argument in my opinion. I'm personally happy to sit down and have a beer and discuss that further at a different date. <laughs> but we're gonna move on from now. To sort of say, this is 2012 and 2011. These are food systems and people's livelihoods that sort of get destroyed by these acts and we really quickly forget about them. They're now happening so quickly that the impacts of them, the costs of them, they, they're with us for a while and then they sort of disappear. So this is Queensland 212 and 211. This is 210. 200, uh, 210, you know what I mean, 2010, oh my god, um, 2009, the Victorian bushfires and just consequently, I like it's, a lot of my presentation is actually situated in Victorian context because I was down there working in this area for, for several years and so I was down there when the Victorian heatwave and the bushfires was on and it's actually um, the, the impacts of those events weren't actually known until several, several years later and more people died in the heatwaves than actually died in the bushfire but that story was never told. The toll on emergency services for the, through the heatwave was actually as great as the toll on emergency services through the fires and there was thousands and thousands of dollars of um, lost stock um, infrastructure that broke down. Victoria had to start importing power from Tasmania throughout to that stage because the grid just broke down. And so in 2006, for those of you that were around, you're never quite sure who's in the audience, particularly when you're at university, um, Cyclone Larry hit and that was like probably one of those impacting moments where people sort of really started to make the link between climatic events and their everyday lifestyles when bananas went up 400 to 500% in price. And that was mainly because most of Australia's bananas production is centralised, along with the 300 million of, um, of bananas that were lost, there was 15 million of avocados and that's before any of the infrastructure costs were added on to it as well. So that's my kind of rant. So yes, as Selena's talked about, um, the problems are big, they're wicked, um, but we need to find the space to change, we need to find the impetus to change and we need to find the inspiration to change. And it can happen at every, every scale. So the main thing is just to get out there and to do it. If you're interested in change, just make it happen. 
And so what does design have to do with anything? Well, design has, over the last couple of years, um, moved from the design of products into the design of other, um, as Selena's talked about, um, different other problem contexts. And the main thing is that design has sort of become very interested in larger scale interventions and how they happen at the local scale and how they can be replicated and adapted um, and distrib distributed. And designing in this kind of context looks at local needs, um, is a collaborative process and is very much a user-centred process. So it has people at the centre of these kind of um, initiatives. So the first project I want to sort of talk to you about was uh, the work I did at a place called the Victorian Eco Innovation Lab and that was um, based at the University of Melbourne but actually involved um, four university, the design departments of four different universities who would get together and sort of do this big think tank scenario stuff and then distribute um, the scenarios to, through to university students who would go around and work on these ideas um, throughout the semester. We would then sort of gather and curate all of the student ideas into an exhibition and take that back to the public. Sorry. Um, and the idea around that was really about trying to tell stories and to get people on board to understand that yes, we needed to change, but that change didn't necessarily need to be so different from what we knew now. And so design had a really integral role in that process of being able to create and tell those stories, to sort of be able to get people to move through the inertia that governments, business and the community often get into, sort of saying, I'm not going to move unless there's demand. I'm not going to move until people tell me that they want to go. And so the, the idea was really how do we start having that conversation with the public around what change is. And so uh, the Victorian Eco Innovation Lab was really charged into bringing a sustainable world into vision. They're still going and they've moved on to other projects in a similar field. Um, changing the landscape of expectations and most importantly sort of letting people know about desirable futures. It's not all doom and gloom, there is positivity in it. So we had a framework of distributed systems, so what would happen if production and consumption happened closer together? So if it wasn't long production change between power stations and, and users, if there was a new type of grid that happened and what might that, what, what, how might local areas start to change? So what might new energy grids look like? What might a new water grid look like? And so at the end of the project we sort of realised that, you know, one of the things that we did was start to use really familiar metaphors. Um, so we lent a lot on what people already knew, but changed it in a different way to sort of talk about new values of, of things. So in this scenario and, and in this context it was, Victoria was going through an incredible drought. It was literally um, the time of those bushfires. So we realised that water was an incredibly important commodity and that, that if you sort of looked at the different types of water that were happening locally and the different uses for water that were happening locally, we could sort of see that there was going to be sort of a type of local exchange of water. And so there would be premium water that was potable water for drinking. There would be high nutrient water, which is essentially urine. Um, there would be recycled grey water, which could be used in public places, premium unleaded, etc. So it sort of just lent off that vernacular. And then there would be someone who was like an insurance broker who could go around and start brokering water. So you would actually start to get paid for the grey water you would produce. So it was the idea that people were not only consumers, they became producers. And that cities could start becoming, when you started to think about what, what changes happened to the urban environment, that cities would actually start to become things like sponges. So we tried to actually make the most value of water where it fell rather than sending it down through stormwater drains. And so a metaphor that we used for that and the story that we told for that was that city is a sponge idea. And so, as you would know, Sydney's had its fair share of recent rainfall and we get inundation events. And this was sort of looking at how can we actually use those problems to create places of community and enhance the urban environment through the need to actually change the way we were working with water. And so here you sort of had an urban billabong. And just the, even the idea of a billabong spoke a lot to people who didn't know anything about design. All of a sudden they started to understand what that could mean. So here were places which were designed to deal with flooding conditions, but also in drought conditions still um, had an aesthetic and, and an ecologically functional value. And this is another way of how these types of places might look. 
And so it was a similar idea with food when we sort of talk about food as a grid. And this is a student's work who sort of looked at an area called Sunshine, which is a suburb of Melbourne, um, and sort of said, well, what if we were looking at schools and sort of had a notion of distributed schools that, that schools, that people <laughs> drove and were lined up out the front dropping their kids off to schools, and what if the school was distributed into the community? What change might that promote? Could, could the departments of education buy houses and reconfigure them for classrooms so that kids weren't travelling as far? And what changes to the streetscapes might that be if there were 40 kilometre zones all over the place um, and people could actually share more of the infrastructure of the road into other mediums? I apologise about the um, quality of that bottom image. And so then other people took that idea several years later and developed it even further and sort of said, well, what about if people could have micro businesses that operated from their houses? What's the economic activity that surrounds this type of food production? So this one sort of looked at an example of a garage being converted into a small community marketplace, like a farmer's market. Ideas that are not strange if you've been in Italy and you've seen the farmer's markets that pop up in the streets all over places like that. And this is, um, Costa, an alternative career for you <laughs> if you decide to get out of media. This was the idea of Jim's permaculture. And so, you know, uh, using a vernacular of Jim's and then applying it to an urban, urban context and sort of said, like in this scenario, the, the people with the Jim's approach, the people who had the houses, they pulled down the back fence, accessed land that wasn't really being used, that was a, a weight for people to keep going. Um, through water and stuff like that. Anyway, I should keep going because I've got a lot more to get through and that's another picture of what that might look like. Um, bus stops con converted into sharing stations and produce stands, adapted, adapted infrastructure, community infrastructure that already exists. Um, and some of this stuff is, not, is starting to happen. It's not like we were visioning 25 years into the future. Five years later, it's happening. The, it's, it's emerging everywhere. Um, and this was the idea of a food depot. Um, it was done for Ballarat for a visioning project for them. Um, but it was the idea that, that instead of a farmer's market, I mean, it's, it's adapted from things like food co-ops, Alpha Alpha House, if people know that, um, a plethora of urban food activities. And the bottom one was the idea that a corner shop should, could actually start to stock local produce. And I think, you know, if anyone's been in Enmore in the last couple of weeks, there's a project down there called the Real Foods pop-up shop, which is doing exactly that. But the idea of what design did was actually create the narratives, create a schematic of the idea which could apply it in many different local contexts. And could we get to the stage that we're taking over petrol stations and turning them into food depots? So how do we get there? If that's the vision, as I sort of said, some of it's happening already. And the second project I'd like to sort of talk to is, is the project I'm currently working on. And so after working on that kind of level strategic work and visioning, I wanted to start to see change happen. And so through the work I'd been doing with a number of networks, one of them, um, Politecnico de Milan, um, and the work of Ezio Manzini, um, was the idea of community-centred design. And so it's designing for more sustainable and connected communities using local resources, local networks, and collaborative solutions. And so this led me to Newtown. And Newtown, um, I think you would all know is an incredibly dense inner urban environment. And so what really attracted me to Newtown is that I knew it really well, but it's a place-based project. And place-based project allow you to sort of create new relations and, and, and synergies between different actors and different groups of people. And it allows you to actually instigate local projects, whether it's local talks or informal connections, people can start sharing expertise and this can start getting stuff off the ground. I was fortunate enough to um, have a job opportunity associated with this. It wasn't advertised as a designer. I just turned it into a design project. Um, it's called the Green Living Centre. It was formerly called the Watershed. Um, and we are a, a jointly run project between two councils and there's three full-time staffing positions there and casual positions. And for all of those people that like a framework, we do have a bit of a design framework which is trying to take people through a sustainability journey of awareness enabling awareness which is the idea of what's going on, enabling which is really skills and knowledge development and sharing, creating community so the social connections around that change and then 
uh, enabling the community to be independent so that it should be able to operate without the support of the GLC, but with the support of things like council grants. One of the things we do is we have a bike library. Um, that's sort of like developing a local resource. People can come and they can share the bike. It works differently from bike sharing. It runs at a minuscule of the cost of most citywide bike sharing schemes. We work with local community groups such as this was the cargo bike picnic where we're sort of really celebration of cycling in, in the local area. It's also trying to get people to sort of change their imagination around what's possible in the local area. Like, you know, King Street's a bit of a fight for cyclists. So we got the biggest bike we could find and we put it out on King Street and hope that that sort of changes some of the official images. Another partnership project, a Newtown Bike Breakfast with Bicycle Garden, who are a co-op, and Alfalfa House, which are another co-op. So together we put on breakfast and we did services and there were 200 local bike people there. DIY bike pannier workshops, so trying to sort of get people to start thinking about how they can use bikes in the local area. It's a pain in Newtown, as people would know, if you need to go to the local shop, you don't really want to have to get into a car. You might want to buy more than you can actually carry. So getting people to sort of try to find, be creative and find solutions to their own problems. So from a design perspective, we've sort of been looking at in food, prototyping a whole lot of different activities. And so, you know, we like to put modes on things and, and, and give them sort of forms. But this is some of the, the work that we've sort of really been doing in the last um, year or so, is sort of looking at how we can sort of prototype a whole lot of community activities. And it really, it's research to sort of see who's out there, what sticks, who's interested in what. So a whole lot of different initiatives. This is some of the stuff which it looks like. Pallet Gardening with Bob from Hobo Grow. Hobo Grow was um, a social enterprise that was started up. Michael Mobbs was involved in it, as was um, TAFE Outreach. So it was getting people who had been long-term unemployed and, um, and skilling them up in, in urban agriculture projects. Jane Malbury from um, Seed Saver. So she runs a local seed saving bank in the area. Um, she comes along and talks to people about seed saving. Going on tours. Uh, so people can experience change where it's happening. Uh, this is the Myrtle Street um, Verge Gardens, um, spearheaded by Michael Mobbs, but also the sustainable community, Chippendale community. Um, we take people on, on the tours and ask them to imagine how their street might change. DIY aquaponics. Aquaponics is a closed loop system. It's very incredibly efficient in terms of growing food. Um, it has fish. Uh, the nutrients from the fish become the plants for the food. We uh, created the system in the workshop um, out of materials easily found in the local areas. One of the things that's great for Newtown too is it actually brings the height of the garden up the wall from the shade. So a lot of um, Newtown gardens have shading issues. So there's quite practical kind of reasons for some of this. But we really sort of found that it's creating more than just the thing, it's creating community and social capital. Um, Newtown Festival, creating awareness. So this was, we ran a food swap, we did some seedling giveaways, we gave the toilet roll away with them, that caused a little bit of a problem for council, but never mind. Um, we covered it in a slip so people didn't know. And it, on the back of the slip, it had instructions on how people could start raising their own seedlings. Mapping. The community, so doing some community engagement, finding out what people wanted. Um, we've actually started working with the City Farm Group, which will be coming in a couple of months. Working with local food stakeholders to sort of find out and to sort of find different directions and new directions for people in Newtown. And then this is the kind of project that um, we're doing now, which is our most uh, significant <coughs> innovative project. Um, and with the idea that the, the city farm, there is a city farm coming to Sydney Park, which is at the end of King Street in Newtown, um, the city farm needs to be financially independent from council's involvement. And so one of the things we were really interested in is, is looking at ways that social enterprises could be developed and what would our be, be our role in almost tending the garden before that happened. And one of the things is the biggest problem on King Street from a business perspective is food waste. So we started a little project where we were sort of trying to trial food waste in those farms or worm bins. Um, in that big one there is some 30,000 30, worms. Um, in three months of, in 13 weeks it <coughs> consumed 62.3 kilos. Five, four weeks of that was really breeding of the worms. So that may not sound a lot. 63 kilos in let's say three months 
was at the third of the food waste for one business in King Street. That's also around a third of a tonne. So we've now been working with another business and we're almost at 100% of their food waste. But it just to sort of say, is like when you're on King Street and there's all those Thai restaurants, just have a bit of a think about how much waste there is going on behind. So we aim to sort of see if we can send these learnings um, into a social enterprise and then into apartment buildings as well, where we can sort of establish these. So one of the things that we've sort of really found from doing this is by normalising and activating, you start making these changes visible in the community, skills building and supporting creative R and DIY projects and celebrating local knowledge. And that's how I think change starts to happen. Moving from uncoordinated activity to coordinated, oops, to coordinated activity. That was just food. We also do reuse and energy. And just to leave you with some principles of community-centred design. Well, um, good evening, everyone. And um, Diane and Selena, thanks for, thanks for sort of opening up in my world. I mean, I could sort of just say, yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice. Um, but look, design is something that's very close to my heart. I, just as a bit of background, my name's Costa Georgiata, so I studied landscape architecture kind of at New South. Um, so this is my alma mater, really. And um, you, you struck something when, when you were talking, Diane, before, like you were talking about design. And I remember sitting on the library lawn out at, at New South Wales Uni one day, and you know, I was in the architecture faculty and like, from a design point of view, imagine the School of Landscape Architecture was in, so my five years of design inspiration was in a hospital building. So back in 19 whenever, they built the main building of UNSW, the old main building, is actually the plans for the hospital. So imagine that, we, we were, we were in these corridors. The corridors were these huge wide corridors because they had to fit beds and beds, two, two bed widths down there. So if someone's running with a bed that way and running with a bed that way. And the rooms had ceilings that were like this. And that was supposed to inspire design. And I remember sitting there one day and I said, man, this is so bad. Uh, like, what are you supposed to do to inspire good design? Are you supposed to turn the door on its side? So that then every time you walk through, you hit it and you think that's bad design. That's going to bash me into being a good designer. No. No, we, we've got to set the goal. We've got to say, if we want good design, we've got to live and breathe it. But we can't live and breathe good design if we're not living and breathing. So my whole, when, when Selena and Joanna told me, would you come along and talk about design for change? Well, you can't design anything if you're not living and breathing. And the only way we live and breathe is by what we put in our mouths. So if you start to then give food a priority as a designer, you will become a better designer, but you will be totally immersed in design because every time you open your mouth, you are creating ramifications of design, not just the design of the food that you choose to put in your mouth, but the design of the landscape that you live in. Because every food decision is a design decision. So my simple question when I talk about this is, when you make that design decision, are you putting produce or product. So it comes down to a decision, a design decision of life and death. Am I putting living produce into this mouth? Or am I putting dead packaged product? So that's a simple little take home exercise. Every time you open your mouth for the next 24 hours, I'm going to be just sitting there on your shoulder and my beard will just tickle you a little bit. Just a little. Just sort of, you know, just there. And when you feel that little tickle, ask yourself, living, dead, life, death, produce, product. 
So when you do that, then you become an activist. Of course you're going to become an activist. You're going to get fired up because you're either fueling a healthy designer and a healthy place of design thinking, or you're fueling one that's on a road to nowhere, that's caught up in the business of consumption. Because all this plays out in a design landscape. Think about the design that's around us. We talk about mimicking nature. That is the ultimate. We can do no better. And in doing that, you, you then can put down the design tools of war. Nature, us, humans, we take it on. We're fighting. We, we need to we need to change that thinking. So really, there's four words that I want to talk about for the next 10 minutes. And the first one is thinking. The way we think creates the world around us. And as designers, our thinking has the potential to absorb and accumulate and gather from nature perfection. Now, perfection's a big word if I start throwing that around. Perfection. You're going to say, well, you think that's perfection. You might think it's not quite. But when it comes to nature as a system, it's been designed and it's been working for a long time. Anything we design is one day, one week, six months, one generation. It's not very old. It hasn't been proven. Industry best practice. As soon as someone says that to me, I'm arcing up. I'm immediately seeing smoke screens. Because from a design point of view, industry be best practice is usually a smoke screen of, we'll just hide here. And it's industry best practice according to who and according to how long. Indigenous industry best practice is 40,000 years old. I might sort of start to go with that. But when we talk about some of these design decisions that are being made on the landscapes that are affecting our health, industry best practice of certain extractive industries, you could ask yourself, they've only been around for a very short period of time and they're making claims on our health that we need to be around. And as Selena said, we need to be active. Because if, if we are the designer, if we are a human designer, we need to look at ourselves as sanctuary. What's your name? Uh, Helen. Helen. Is that there any other Helens in the room? There's no other Helens. Your sanctuary. As a designer, your sanctuary. Your design, your thinking comes from your background. But you have to fuel that background. And the pressures on the fuel that you put in are your daily design decision choices. And I think that those choices, when we draw it back to the vocabulary behind those choices, we start to sieve the rubbish and get more to the truth. Think about the words that you say. Think about the structure of those words. There's a lot of battle. There's a lot of war. There's a lot of, we're fighting against this. We can push and we can push and we can push or we can step around these things. And from a design point of view, when you look at a problem and take it on as a battle, there'll be a very different outcome to if you take it on as an entire project where you look at it non-confrontationally. And that thinking, for me, that thinking for me always comes back to food. Because if I, if I don't feed you within four hours, not that I'll be talking to you for four hours. You could. I, I could, yeah, with, with absolutely no problem. But within four hours, you're not designing anything competently. You'll tick a box.
the landscapes that we design in are nurturing our ability to design. But we're doing other things, because it's not just the food we put in our mouth. It's the other things that we put on our body that affect our ability to design. Someone designed this. They were given a brief, as Selena said, or as, as I'm not sure I was saying. You're given a brief. But they're not telling you the full story because all the real information, all the real information is hidden in there. And the fact that that's got aluminium in it, which from us as a living entity, the most absorbent part of our body is in here, in here. And we spray aluminium on it. Labelling becomes our business when we look at ourselves as a living thing and we think about whether we're putting products in and on our body or whether we're putting produce and whether our actions are being sold by designers and as a designer, are you telling the truth? Or are you just selling something? And there's a lot of non-truths in that, particularly directed at our kids, because it gets marketed as, you know, you're a better sportsman when you spray with that. But what's the point? The point is, life or death, that's giving out a message of death because it's saying anti, anti-perspire. We perspire because as a living system, we need to we need to vent, we need to vent toxins from our body and antiperspirant blocks it. So that's how, as a designer, we can get intimately connected with environment, we can get intimately connected with issues because we make it personal. And we make it personal because we think about it, but we look at the vocabulary that we use and we combine this to say, okay, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to be responsible as a designer. And someone says, yeah, but I've got to make my money. I'll just sell out. Well, you have to live with that. And you also have to sit and think, well, what am I giving out to the broader environment and what am I doing for people? So the, the opportunity exists to combine those three things with food and health at the top. And when you have that as, as the pinnacle, then your decisions will become clear and you won't involve yourself in designing something like that. And then when you, don't, when you don't design something like that, well, guess what? If you don't design it, it's not bored. If it's not bored, it doesn't exist anymore and it falls off the shelf. And it doesn't have to be. It's just your action, your day-to-day -day action. And, and the, most, the most exciting part about it for me when it comes to this sort of thing is it has to be emotional. We've got so much information these days. I can, I can pick up any topic, labelling, um, container deposit schemes, um, food systems, whatever. You can hit one of 200,000 hits. But who's going to read all that? And what's going to be the point? As designers, we've got to take that little bit of information and like that image that you put up of the petrol, the petrol houses, that told a huge story. I just judged a competition for um, um, short films and uh, basically there was one bit of information. New South Wales wastes $2.5 billion worth of food every year. And there was 30 second and three minute films. 30 seconds, that's all you need. 30 seconds, and just like that image of the Bowsers, bang, there's the water, there's the price, people just go, Oof. and these films were fantastic. And, and when I talk about design, that's where the vocabulary and the expression of the vocabulary to connect here to the heart is what we need. So I can tell you a story about plastic bags, or, Okay, would you like paper or plastic?
the ball show on back Yeah, but you forgot it though You were busy dreaming of ice cream and all that cookie dough Your life is wrapped in plastic Convenience is your motto But plastic addiction's worse than they want you to know BP's oil spill, almost like we did it We use one million grossy bags every single minute Recycling them's a joke, yo That baggie don't go anywhere Turns a little piece and it spreads over everywhere Into your food supply, into your blood supply Not to mention birds and fish and cuties You don't wanna die Look at baby Sammy, dioxins in his milky way Cause even a breast milk, it's got PCB and BPA Okay, now you get it How you gonna stop it though? Banning single-use plastic bags, it's the way to go Join other states and cities, kick the nasty habit Tell your representatives to ban single-use bags Make fun That will stick with you. There was a lot of message in there. There was convenience. There was plastic. Everything. Everything you want to say in a PowerPoint or you put it in a song. Plastic. Toxic products or your cracks made up. There's one thing you can do. It's bad single use. Bad single use. Yeah, sure, you can ban them, but you ban them yourself. You ban them yourself, you become the design ripple. I was talking to a group of kids at, at, in a sustainability expo at, at Toronto Zoo yesterday. And as Selena said earlier, spheres of influence, or it was Diane, or was it Selena? Diane's one of them. Spheres of influence. Spheres of influence. We are the biggest sphere of influence. <coughs> and, as, and as a designer, when you put when you put your world as priority and you look at the things that you promote through your decisions, well then you ripple out to the rest of the world and you can change the world by changing your decisions. And that to me is the most active, positive, proactive way that we can go about change. And we can do it every time we open our mouths because we're designing the world. And it ties in perfectly with what Diane was talking about with systems, whether it's the water system, whether it's the food system, and designing that to be, next point, fourth point, local. <laughs> Localised systems are the way to go. Local is simple, it's close, it's got character. When we talk about local regions, you go around Italy, you go to a local region, this is the best region for these things. They celebrate that. They celebrate what they do well. They design localness. And we can do it and it's happening. The, the slides we looked at, and I, I've got a whole heap of slides in here that I, could have, that I could have thrown up to tell you about the Verge garden that I've created on my street. I'm not going to go there because you don't need to see them. I'll put them up and share them. You can see them on the, on the web. But the point is, I make a decision in my street on the corner of my house to plant a garden. I then start to influence the whole street because every morning the people walk up and they walk past it. The kids are like, oh, that's fantastic. People drive past in their cars. What are you feeding those vegetables, Costa? I said, sunlight and a bit of water. Oh, but they're growing so big. People haven't seen those things. I'm going to put wheat in the street so that they can see wheat growing. And then off that verge, we talk about how much wheat you can get off one verge to make a loaf of bread. And there'll probably be like an area this big will do three loaves of bread so people can then understand and they can watch the wheat grow for nine months and be part of the design of a loaf of bread from, from this, from, from the seed. And the beautiful, incredible design behind that seed to it becoming a loaf of bread, or it becoming, in three weeks, this one in three weeks becomes a lettuce, and that one becomes a gourd in about three months, and some, something else and something else. But that action
action of putting a design process right in front of people where they live, where they live, it does not get more powerful. And for me, food is the most powerful thing. It's the one thing we all have in common. It's the one thing that we all do at least five times a day. And it's the one way that we can change and work with the world we live in. It's not just about changing the world. Like the structure underneath all of this is there and it's intact. Well, it's not intact, it's got some problems. But the structure's there and the, and the one where you were talking about the, the sponge of the city, I mean, we need to rehydrate the city. So as you go home tonight, from a design point of view, I want you to undress the city and expose the landscape. You know, people, I should have left my stunned shirt on so I could just go... <laughs> and say, I want you to rip the shirt, I want you to rip the lands, um, the built environment off the city on your way home and ask yourself this question as you go down the hill. Oh, where would the water go? And what are we doing with it now? We're taking it away. And what's the sun do when it hits here? And think about that from a design point of view. Think about where you could grow things. Think about where you could store and hold water. Think about, from a design point of view, how the landscape is a lung and it's a it's, it's not just a lung it's a kidney and how can i catch the water and keep it look at these structures these drains these are these are roman technology that we're using to dehydrate our environment we wonder why we need air conditioners and things like that because we're just building heat instead of building lush cool so so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll finish off on that point by just, by just summarising. Thinking. Design is thinking. But we can't think without food. We need to look at the vocabulary because what we say is what we become. They need to think about what comes out of your mouth and also what goes in it. And what comes out is as important as what goes in. And when you, are, when you actually change what goes in, what comes out is going to get better. It's going to get more integrated with living things, not dead things. Living produce, not dead product. Then we need the vision and the communication skills to get those ideas out there. So a video like that, a picture of the Bowsers, another image. Lift, you know, the classic lift spiel. You've got 30 seconds to tell someone why climate change is not a thing of the past and it's right now. You've got 30 seconds, you've got to cut to the chase. And for me, the way we achieve that is we have to talk, we have to talk here. We've got, it. We've got the information. We've got more than enough information. It's all been done. And it's been done. And I get excited about seeing slides of what you're doing because you know, my task in my sphere of influence is to take these ideas which I'm doing and put it out to mainstream. Put it onto the TV and say to people, we can do this and we can do it right here and we can do it right now. And you as designers can make those systems work. But I say, take it and use this. Turn that information in there into something that connects here. And when you connect it there, that means you can come up with an image that cuts to the chase. People get it, they take it home, and they act on it.